Good Sunday, fun day to all you guys out there, guys and gals out there. This is Charlie Maverick, and this is the Backyard Pitmaster Podcast. First episode being brought to you by Anchor.fm. Hey, it's the easiest way to start your podcast. Get it out there for people to hear, make some money off of it. You know, I think podcasting is awesome. This is the new form of uh, sharing your thoughts, emotions. I know I podcast because I uh, I ramble too much for a uh, a regular Facebook post. Twitter doesn't give me enough characters. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here with you today, starting a new rebranded podcast on the Mavcast Audio blog. Got the inspiration yesterday talking to my homeboy terrence p elmore that is a friend of the show the flagship podcast which is the mathcast podcast if you haven't heard any of those podcasts when terrence and i you know talk about what we're watching and being black in america awesome awesome series that we usually do this is a long time friend of the show and it's awesome go ahead and check those out yeah got a got an inspirational moment when talking to terrence and he was like uh i'm not gonna tell all your business <laughs> but trying to get an idea of how to do a certain technique of grilling this weekend all for it just happened to have a podcast that i recorded in the past about techniques of grilling smoking poultry so passed that on then i got the idea hey you know i'm rebranding all these shows that i had on the podcast network channel however you want to call it try to make it more clearly defined and easy to understand the mission of each of them so you don't have to figure out like what is this guy talking about here i talk about a lot of stuff but uh it has to make sense to the content and the delivery right so done myself why not rebrand the whole grill talk thing which seems kind of generic to me to something more formal i guess the backyard pit master podcast sounded like a good idea so i went with it (laughs) so here we are i got a lot to talk about got a lot to talk about but i just got to point out a few things you know covid's going on out there still running rampant so you guys still be safe out there that's a host priority over anything out there and you know R.I.P. the DMX. I don't know if you're hip-hop fans or not. If you're not, I encourage you to try out that genre. It might change your life. Just like 80s rock constantly inspires me to take on anything. You know, just try new things. You might you might find some hidden gems in there. But DMX, major, major influence on the hip-hop community in the 90s. Unfortunately, met his demise at the hands of drug use. So, always got to say, watch out for people that are close to you, you love, care about, that have addiction. It is, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is something that is uh, is a constant burden on every community, right? any community and we got to take it seriously got to really take it seriously we lose too many people to that and he was doing so good Uh, he has an album coming out soon i don't know what your conspiracy theories are and how the universe works i don't know i don't you know that's your opinion but regardless of that he was a well-loved person. 
you know he did <laughs> amazing things when you look back at his his uh legacy of i always call it content creation not only known for his music but known for his movies and how can we forget and this is kind of starting as a tradition now that <laughs> We play Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the DMX version, around Christmas. Oh, yes. I love that. <laughs> if you haven't heard it, please, please YouTube it. Oh, you're going to get hooked on it. It just makes you smile. But, you know, good spirit always tried to, you know, see the better in the world, even though he went through a lot of trials and tribulations as we call it you know a tortured soul in a sense as many of us are out there so all that to be said rest in peace rest in power sleep in peace however you say your uh, give your respect pay your respects you know, uh, DMX, you will be missed. All right, so sad loss here, but let's talk about some other things. Let's talk about grilling, shall we? Let's talk about what I made last week first. It was a spectacular weekend. April had her birthday. If you don't know who April is, she's my wife, beautiful wife. We always love to make things at home. And of course, when there's an opportunity to get on the grill, my beloved Weber Kettle grills, I take the opportunity. And April loves steak, but I'm not a steak guy. So I thought it was a good idea to have some diversity because we're in the age of diversity, right? <laughs> you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into one protein. No, no, why not? Take it upon yourself to venture out and to reintroduce yourself to certain things or to introduce yourself to new things, you know? So I saw the opportunity to not only reverse sear a cowboy ribeye and if you don't know what a cowboy ribeye is it's like a hmm, it's a ribeye with a bone in it and it's fairly large in size and thick so reverse sear always works well with thick cuts of meat especially that with steak i'll go through that again because i know i begin a few questions about the reverse sear because i mentioned it to my friends and family, and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? But I'll, I'll go through that briefly as we go through this journey of food that was made in the past seven days. I think it was seven days, right? Yeah, seven days. Yes, man. So not only that cowboy ribeye was cooked on the Weber kettle, there was also a... Well, I would say two nice, real decent quality salmon steaks found at Walmart. I think Walmart's stepping up the game. You hear Walmart, you're like, really, dude? <laughs> Did you get it from Walmart? No, I got a witness. I have a witness that uh, they're, they're stepping the game up. They have a f uh, fresh, never frozen section. Like, you know how Publix does with this, certain fishes. Fishes. I said fishes. Yes, I did. I'm not apologizing. But Walmart's stepping the game up. So I'm like, all right. I look, it looked good. And uh, yeah, got two of them. And they it came with this pesto butter type of uh, cylinder shape coin shape thing you know and i'm like oh you know well, let's let's try it you know let's try it 
I always wanted to do fish on the grill. You know, surprisingly, I haven't done fish a lot on the grill. I've done it in the past, but it's not anything to be remembered. It was not when I was trying to like diversify uh, my grilling um, portfolio, but I kind of, I wasn't ready, you know? And you'll get what I mean as, as I keep talking. Rambling on, as some people would say. So I saw I saw these like two really good looking salmon steaks. So I got those, and I saw a pack of uh, tuna steaks, also at Walmart. And look, I know I still know what you're saying. Really, at Walmart? No, there. Trust me, at your Walmart, look out for it. It's right by the beef. To the left of it, usually, I think this. I mean, it's it's not really consistent at Walmart, but it it will be I like easily identifiable because it, like oh that looks like you know fresher type seafood that you would find at a traditional grocery store. And, you know, I say Walmart stepping the game up because sometimes they kind of have a lot of stuff frozen. Like the seafood they usually have is like only frozen stuff, right? So. And you wonder how it's sourced or whatever, but they say wild caught. So I thought they called it wild. And then I got the tuna steaks. And the tuna steaks, they really look good. And I've used tuna steaks, bought tuna steaks from Publix. These actually look like a better quality than I got from Publix. Yeah. I'm I was surprised myself. Whatever. Judge ye not until you chai. That made sense to me how I said it. But took it upon myself to have all these proteins. So got on the Weber Kettle, got on the um, the Weber Kettle Master Touch. This is what I use for this. I have two Weber Kettles. I have to keep reminding people that I, I mainly only use you know charcoal grills. I'm not like this snob or whatever, or this this like you know grilling version of a self proclaimed audiophile. To where I just strictly charcoal has to be, it has to be charcoal. No, I mean, I just like it. it just, I found out a method that it's not really, you know, exhausting for me to do it. And I always like the results. I just mastered the master touch, I guess. So I have two of them and they really balance out well. And I got a slow and sear for my birthday. Oh man, if you don't, if you have a Weber kettle and you don't have a slow and sear, I really think you should go out and get and treat yourself. I've been holding out for years, and man, I tell you, that uh, that slow and sear is something serious. So this is that's what I cooked it on. I put the steak on and performed a reverse sear. Now let me let's go through that first, right? You want to know about that, right? I talked about it with the with the um the steak pinwheels but this is kind of different because you could kind of go in a little bit harder with this one because it's not as delicate as a pinwheel oh and uh if you stay tuned i'm gonna talk about some salmon pinwheels yeah that was cooked yesterday so to the reverse sear of the steak so i put that on um a, a lot of I've been getting a lot of questions about how to, you know, start up grills and blah, blah, blah. And to find out that people want to know things about the basics, you know. And I got to say, some might think that their grill is cheap and, you know, I mean, some are. But it's knowing how to use your tools. You can have like an expensive green egg or a Jumbo Joe Kamado grill or this big, long Weber um, grill that you have in an outdoor kitchen, and you might just be like effing up all your food. But it's all about how you use the tools that you have before you invest money and think that, hey, I can do anything with this thing. You can't do anything unless you know the techniques. And the techniques are always different, but there are some baselines. I covered a lot of this in my Grilling 101 series, but so I won't go into deep details about it. So I'll give you some highlights. And if you want to listen to more detail, Go ahead, go and listen to those. Just keep scrolling into the feed for the past episodes and it's easily identifiable. I, I titled it. 
specifically as such, you know, growing 101. Got to do that. I, I really suggest that. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to repeat a lot of the stuff that I said in that recording. So let's get to the main thing. Got that steak sitting on the Weber kettle opposite side of the slow and sear and it's indirect heat and i always like to cook things indirect why do i do that basically it gives me more control over the temperature and i always try to get the perfect temperature of steak and uh my wife and i's uh perfect temperature of steak is around 140 145 ish top end you can hit 150 but we try to avoid it. And that's our medium, right? It's juicy. It's flavorful. You get everything that you get. These layers of flavor, a nice crust on the exterior, and you get the perfect temp inside every time, right? If you just use techniques. And this is the reverse sear. What I like to do is cook on indirect heat and then bring it up to a certain temperature before I start doing some fancy stuff to it, right? So I brought it up to like 120. And I'm like, hey, when it gets to 120, it, it accelerates to a certain speed to get to different levels of temperature pretty quickly. So you got to act fast. So 120 is about, you know, rare, right? Yeah. Medium rare, somewhere around there transitioning to different stages of temperature and you're like hey i want to put some butter on there so put some uh was it garlic butter oh garlic herb butter if you haven't had it ah just gotta buy it buy it try it put it on your steak and um basted it with that in a sense right before right before and do this right before you take that steak from the indirect side where it's the cool side of the grill and you put it on the direct fire, the coals itself. And you sear that flavor in. You hold it there and you got to, don't walk away from this thing. Please don't walk away from it. <laughs> when you start searing meat, don't walk away because conditions are always different. And you never know how quickly that sear is going to be in. So pay attention. Don't walk away and be like, yeah, I got, I got two minutes. Come back. So don't close that grill. While the thing's on direct heat, walk away and expect a flare up not to happen. I'm just saying it's beef still. I'm just saying, you know, it's not chicken flare up, but <laughs> come on. You don't want to overshoot your temp because you thought you knew too much, right? So stand over it because what you also want to do in that moment, keep yourself busy and make some nice grill marks. You know, you can turn it, make the diamond shaped ones, make it look nice and pretty. You can get that easily done um, with the reverse sear. And man, it is it's awesome when you do that because you get best of both worlds. You could do the sear first and then bring it up to temp. But I always find that you're able to retain more flavor internally. Like the flavor permeates deeper into this thicker cut of meat if you do the reverse sear, bring it up to a certain temp, then sear it, bring it up to the finishing temp that you wanted at. It, it, I don't know. Just think of it as cooking a pork shoulder. And that long cook develops a lot of heat. And think of how you've had a steak that you've done the regular sear, then bring the temp or just sear the whole time until you it gets to the temp where you think it's at, then eat it. Just think of how much more flavor can get into the meat if you just cook it slower. Not at a lower temp on the grill, but not on the direct fire. What you need to accomplish this also is simple tool. Get like a $9 instant read thermometer, people. If you, you, I mean, these are tools that I use to take out the, the you know, possibility of error. It's a constant theme. Eliminate possibilities of error because variables cooking outside on a grill of any kind is never a consistent experience. 
And if you guys have cooked a lot on the grill, you know you can't depend on time um, or the same results happening every last time unless unless you have created your controlled environment to where you know your method is like flawless every time you you have no variables like wind temperature of the you know ambient temperature outside or whatever like that some do have that like you know professional grill spots smokes smoke stacks out there you know they have their controlled environments for the most part or they've they've built in a cushion to know how to adjust based on normal conditions and you know again with everything with fire based you have to learn to adjust and pivot so did that oh man it was so good as i usually do with steak i, I really like to have a that charcoal taste in there is it's nothing like it you could do it on the propane grill but man not the light charcoal to me and i'm not i'm not being that bougie person again it was like yeah you got to do that charcoal and nothing else but man come on even even if you don't put wood smoke on it i i like to have wood smoke but not everybody likes wood smoke but if you have a chance to put like hmm, i don't know this is beef you could probably put post oak on there get a nice deep texas towel flavor on there depending on what seasoning you use and that'd be awesome Let's move on to what I did next was the salmon. And there was this was pretty easy. So I won't stay on this long. <laughs> you know, I'm salmon's pretty darn easy to cook like any fish. You just have to know the right technique, right? Cool. So salmon, uh, they're pretty large. So I, I tore off a pretty large piece of aluminum foil and created a pocket for the, the sit-in. So you know, I gave it a, a little bit of room for air, so I didn't have it like rolled up into like a this closed pocket. I had it open, so maybe more like a uh, like a a baking sheet type formation around it, so it can still retain its moisture. You know, not stick to the grill, so I don't have to worry about that. And then I can move it on and off the grill or different areas of the grill without worrying about this fish falling apart. You can use those, like, those, I don't know, call them, like, cages or whatever accessories that you can get that is specifically for doing vegetables and fish. You can do that, but I, I've tried that. I don't I don't trust it because any false move, the contraption could be too loose <laughs> or too tight, and it gives you the illusion that you can flip this fish and it's going to keep its integrity every time that's a false sense of hope that i I, don't, I wouldn't encourage so yeah just just take the easy way out and use aluminum foil let it be your friend and create these like little um baking sheets that for each of them individually depending on you know how many you have maybe it's just one but how many of you do the individual size roll it up on the sides give it a little room and then just put it on the cold side of the grill indirect cooking again and believe it or not the steak and the salmon cooked at the same rate of temperature like they stayed with the same temps along the way as it cooked which made it really easy what temperature did i have the grill at you ask i mean i had the top and bottom vents wide open had the coals full with um uh, Royal Oak natural briquettes. I like those, but I, I'm I'm thinking about switching. I think about switching to you know B and B. I hear a lot of good things about them. They're they're expensive, but I've heard Champion, you know Pitmasters, use this. So you know I got to got to take the recommendation, right? Got to try it out. So. Yeah, used that, got it hot, had it in the slow and sear, and the slow and sear is awesome. Again, the slow and sear makes your Weber kettle more like a Kamado grill, and I had one of those Kamado grills before, like a big green egg, but it was a, you know, acorn uh, by, what is it called, the char grill acorn, you know, it holds the temperature, it helps it hold the temperature like a Kamado grill, but I didn't monitor the ambient temperature of the grill. It could get as hard as it wanted to get. I know I wasn't going to burn anything because I was doing indirect cooking, right? That's that's a constant theme. 
hit the mic. <laughs> That's the constant theme, but you're always going to get the best results by your controlled environment of doing, you know, indirect cooking. That so you're always going to get the best results possible from doing it because you can control things. Don't cook all directly on the fire unless you really, really have to. Don't try to be a hero, man. Even with burgers, don't try to be a hero. Take the safe way. It might take longer, but the product is going to be a lot better. Be patient. Grilling is about patience. Be calm. Let it be your zen place. Yes. So just let that cook up to about 130 degrees and start basting that with the uh, pesto that came with it in the pack. The pesto butter came with it. It was awesome. Yep. Didn't sear that any at all. However, you can move the foil packet open face foil packet over to the hot side of the grill for a second. If you want the skin that is you know, facing the aluminum foil, if you want that to kind of crisp up a little bit, but it's not going to really do you any good. And, you know, again, don't walk away from that if you try to do it, but hey, you can do it if you want to, you know, just make sure you don't call that doesn't cause you to overshoot your internal temperature for your fish, but you should be okay. As long as you monitor it. All right. That was easy. Put some barbecue sauce on there, honey, Create a glaze real quick, and it sets pretty quickly. So, you know, by the time you get to your desired, I would say 140 degrees internal, 145 for this internal too, about the same as a steak, and you cook it indirect and you put that barbecue sauce and honey on there, it's going to keep that fish moist. So it's, it might actually seem like you're going to a higher temperature internal based on when you, if you look like a, at a graph. But because you put that, you know, barbecue sauce on there and honey or whatever type of liquid you put on there, it's going to help the moisture retain in the fish. So don't worry about it. Don't just don't leave it on there too long. Take the internal temperature and as long as it doesn't exceed 145, you're good. Once it does, make sure it's off by then. Yes. Then the tuna steak. Oh, the tuna steak. Tuna steak was awesome. Um, did a soy type of quick marinade on the, with soy and salt, pepper, garlic, whatever. E- any season that you want, you know. I used a really small cast iron skillet. Put a little butter in that. Actually, I lie. I put bacon in it. Put a strip of bacon in it. Let it crisp up. I think I eventually gave it to Polo, my dog. Um, I think I did. Pretty sure I did. Maybe not. I think I chopped it up later. I don't know. But um, I used that bacon grease in there. Got it hot, really hot on the hot side of the grill, right on the slow and sear, right on top of it. And then quickly seared both tuna steaks. They're, they're not large. They're not large steaks. About palm size, maybe. Maybe palm size. See them for like a, I don't know, less than a minute on each side, maybe 30 seconds. Then, after I did that, I put it directly on the grill grate over the hot coals. And you ask, why did I do that two-step thing? Well, to me, to ensure fish doesn't stick on your grill i i kind of thought it might have been a better idea to form some type of a beginning crust on the tuna really quickly you know you don't keep it in cast iron skillet for long because remember you want this tuna steak not to be cooked all the way through in the middle you want it to be kind of like a medium rare if anything you want some grill flavor to get into it, but you don't want, you want pink. You definitely want pink inside. So you don't leave it into the pan for, you know, a long time. You just get that starting crust on there. 
because the bacon grease will help it get that beginning crust really quickly versus, I mean, you could use oil, but I always have this kind of song on my head, tuna fish and bacon. <laughs> I always like that. Yeah. Yeah, I did. I said that tuna fish and bacon. And, you know, I like the combination of, you know, how fish and bacon goes together. And I've had tuna fish and bacon before. I'm not going to go into a tangent about it. But look, bacon is, makes everything better. Okay. Just go with it. Bacon makes everything better. Even if you don't eat the bacon, the renderings from the bacon grease <laughs> makes everything better. I tell you, Really quickly, I didn't like sweet peas until I fried it in bacon fat. That's it. Proof enough. Bacon makes everything better. And when I did the short um, direct contact grilling with the tuna, just to get the nice grill marks on there. You don't, Also, you don't want to keep it on the direct fire quick, like for, for a long period of time at all. Just... As quickly as you moved it around in the cast iron skillet, you want to move it around direct fire. Again, you do not want this fish to cook all the way through. So you just want it to have enough contact to get flavor from the grill, the charcoal, or wood that you've put in there. And, hey, you got a meal. Cut it. Uh, I'm not really good at cutting um, tuna. I can't. I can't remember if it's against or with the grain. I'm pretty sure it's like with the grain. Pretty sure about that. <laughs> I don't know. But you want to cut it into slices. And the way I had it, it was on a uh, uh, a what is it a pear and something salad that my wife bought for me. Really good. Uh, it's not arugula, but but parent. I don't know. Anyway, it was good. It was from Publix. Look it up. So put it on like something that ha- has like maybe a citrus balance or or something that is maybe Asian themed in a generic or direct way. You know, it would go well with that. And the dressing I would use, I made a my own dressing with it because. I didn't want to put the dressing that came with the bag salad kit. I didn't want to put that on there. It didn't seem like it would go. I don't remember the name of the dressing. It was like a, it was mayonnaise based. So I was like, I don't know if that would go on this. So I took a little bit of uh, sesame oil, took a little bit of uh, soy sauce, and I took some um, guacamole. Mm. And mix that together, put that in there, mix it up, and that created an awesome, awesome uh, flavor balance with the seared salmon. That was awesome. Definitely going to do that again. So, where are we at right now? You're probably asking, when are you going to talk about this dunk on pinwheel, Charlie? I'm about to do it now. But before I do that, I want to take time out to let people know, let's support small businesses. Small businesses of people that look like and don't look like us. Help small businesses succeed out there in the midst of a pandemic where, you know, it's structured now to cause them to fail. They have to try extra hard out there to go with guidelines and restrictions for COVID. They have to pivot of how they deliver the food to people versus in person, blah, blah, blah. They have to make sure that they don't get sick and they're small business owners. So they're the employees too. You know, they have different struggles out there that large businesses don't. So be sure to support entrepreneurs, Small businesses out there. Daddy's Girls Bakery in Charleston, South Carolina. If you are there, if you can order from them, support them because they're wonderful people doing wonderful things in the community, trying to make a great 
atmosphere for their family. And, um, you know, tell Nate that um, when you see him, he's doing great things. Because you're going to love the Chewies. <laughs> I love Chewies. I know, you know, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to front. I haven't had their Chewies, but, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's widely raved. That is great. I have had some, uh, I, I still can't remember what it was. It was, it was at a wedding reception. Somebody's going to text me and they're like, yeah, dude, your memory is terrible. But, I mean, whatever it was, it was like an individual type type portion thing. Kind of like, um, you know, you don't have to go up and cut your own slice or anything. You know what I'm saying? Kind of like a cupcake form. I think it was like that. I think, I'm pretty sure it was a cupcake. Yep. Pretty sure it was a cupcake form. And I, to, I, I kept going back. So not only do they make their, their the appearance of things look great, they constantly get great reviews, return customers, and they're great people, man. Great down to earth people that grew up with uh, Nate. And uh, yeah, God bless him and his family. So also, also promote, promote content creators out there. It's hard out there because everybody and their mama is doing podcasts now. So it's hard to break through to the audience that you could have gotten some years ago. I've been doing this a long time. It's hard there for a pimp. <laughs> I'm just, I hate that movie, but it's hard, man. It's hard to break through. I took a hiatus for a while. I'm just, <laughs> ooh, man, know how it is, you know. And others are kind of like me in the sense, with struggling, struggling, trying to get out there, get their message out there. People got some really good content out there for you to hear that are lesser known content creators, not mainstream people that have these big backings and contracts. They got some good stuff out there. There's poets, there's singers, there's rappers, producers, artists like drawing, digital art, hand painted art. A lot of things out there. They're taking, you know, YouTube and creating shows like cooking shows and and tutorials on things that are free to you that you would otherwise have to pay money for. Be sure you support people that are bringing you the highest quality content they can possibly bring you. Support them so they can keep their dream alive because the arts and, you know, any type of form of content creation, it could be music, but anything needs to be, needs to be nourished and, and, and attended to. And we have to keep the hope alive for these people to keep bringing this stuff to us. Because isn't it fun when you find like this this gym on YouTube and you just become a fan and you go down a rabbit hole and you, you keep watching and watching or you, or you find a podcast, like one of those obscure podcasts where you never would have found out unless you were on a, in a Facebook group. And you're like, oh, this is awesome. Wow, I would have never listened or watched this. Keep the keep the hope alive, man. So promote your fellow content creators out there, especially if you're a content creator yourself. And we'll promote the room. The room podcast. Yes. From uh from D Haskell. Hope I said it. Is uh, hope I said his uh, his name right that he uses. <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome thing. Talks about relationships. You know, talks about love. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. And pillow talk by my homeboy Barry Washington. Oh man. Both of these guys doing awesome things. Hey, hey, not to mention, not to mention, 
The Brown Sugar Cafe. Terrence P. Elmore. Yeah. Poet, author, soon to be podcaster. We're working on that. <laughs> yeah. He's going to text me later about that. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's talk about Pinwheel. This is what you came for, people. I know. I know. Like, Charlie, you talk so much. Hey. Hey. I'm a fan of traditional radio. I do long form media. I know. I know we're in the society now that, you know, we watch quick, 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 quick. You know, forms of content, but I try to paint a picture for you because this is audio only. You know, it's like listening to an audio book. You guys are used to that, right? So you just cruise down the street. Don't listen to the show if you like trying to quickly learn something, but let me entertain you for a little bit, maybe take you away from CNN. There's some good stuff happening. It's not as bad as it was, but let's take you away. Sunday, fun day. All right. So where we are now is the pinwheels. Man. So how did this come up? I've been wanting to do this for a while. My wife and I have been wanting to do this pinwheels for a while. What are the pinwheels? So pinwheels are basically you taking a filet of a fish or protein because we do stay i mean stay you could do it too but we're, we're talking about do it from salmon so it's basically a fillet of a salmon a large fillet of a salmon not the small ones that you you basically would have a portion of like just a salmon steak it's the entire fillet of a large piece of salmon it should be the the container should be a no shorter than a foot. <laughs> serious, I'm serious. Come on, you got you got to need a big piece of fish. We got us from Costco. Wh- where? Did, why did we get inspired for this? Well, we we had the steak pinwheels from Publix, and they offered a salmon pinwheel that was stuffed with crab salad. And we're like. It's expensive. It's like in the twenty dollars for like two pieces. And like we could probably make that better ourselves, based on how we deconstructed the steak pinwheel. That we just, I mean, we just usually buy that from Publix. That's more cost effective, actually, to just buy that one. But when you get up to like. <laughs> The price that the Publix was charging for that one, and you're like, yeah, well, I want to, I want to control the quality of crab that goes in here because I don't know if this imitation crab it probably was. I don't know the you know specific ingredients that they used. Yeah. So my wife was like, yeah, let's try this, and we went a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, you know, slowly studying this thing, watching YouTube videos, and we're like, we can do this looks intimidating because it's so beautiful if you execute it right. So we're like, ah, let's try it. We can do it. Why not? We can do anything. We've done fish before. And I, I, backyard pit master, myself, I can handle it on the grill. Let's just make sure it gets on the grill, right? So I've done complex stuffed proteins before. Although it seemed intimidating, just wanted to make sure that we didn't waste an expensive-ish cut of fish. You know, just want to go all willy-nilly, not having a strategy cooking this thing, right? So went in, and we got these two beautiful, large Alaskan, I think Atlantic. It's Atlantic caught salmon from Costco. And pro tip out there, uh, yeah, Costco can be ordered through Instacart. That's amazing. So uh, I didn't want to, didn't feel like going to, you know, Costco to 
let's get a couple of stuff. So my wife was like, yeah, you know, let's see if, uh, let's see if they'll deliver it. And they did, of course. I mean, why not? That was awesome. Um, and she got some other stuff from the store. So I didn't even have to go to the store to get any of the ingredients. Awesome. Food delivery. I mean, it's, you got to pay the convenience fee or a subscription fee. However, they, you know, dime you for it. <laughs> but, hey, I mean, maybe it's less than the gas I would have spent to go back and forth. I got to spend more time. So, hey, you know, use that when you can, when it's, you know, an opportune time to use, as some people say, an opportune time to use it. I mean, because that was really convenient. And it kind of lessened, I guess, the, uh, I don't know, possible stress that I had to go into. Like, oh, I got to deal with people now getting these ingredients. Then it was iffy weather outside, so I wasn't really sure if it was going to actually go down yesterday. So, you know, it eventually did. So let's cut to the chase. We got there. Got to the point where we were like, okay, you know, let's get this thing done. So uh, April had crab meat, real crab meat, not the imitation stuff. Yeah, yeah. Stay away from that. If that's all you can get, I won't judge you. But that shouldn't be all you can get. I don't know. I'm just saying, go to Publix. Somebody, somebody should have. Real canned crab meat, at least. Uh, I'm, I don't know. You got you bought the expensive fish. You might as well buy like the rest of the ingredients. You know, quality, right? If unless you, you know, went crabbing and you, you caught some crab and you could just, you know, deshell them, you know, use that. That's awesome. Actually, if you feel like doing that, because sometimes I, there has been a couple of occasions where I've actually cooked a shellfish and deshelled it and used it in another dish. It takes a lot more time and work, but it works out. So, hey, if you could get some, you know, whole blue crab and you can, you know, deshell them all. If that's what you want to do while you eat them, maybe you want to eat some, maybe you want to save some, do that. You're going to need a lot of them though, but whatever. So um, also some cream cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese, let that warm up. Uh, Real, real fresh garlic. I like this garlic press my mom got me for a, a birthday. Man, that was awesome. Garlic presses, you got to get a garlic press. Do the fresh garlic. Just, just, you have the full, like, I think it's a bloom of flower. I don't know. And you got the whole big clove. Like, it's called clove. And you just press it down and you put the individual little pieces in there. And man, it's easy. Fresh garlic, awesome. Uh, salt, pepper, whatever. And season it how you want to. How I did the actual salmon is went in and did a light salting of um, salt and pepper, sea salt and black pepper, mixed up 50-50, which I use as a base for a lot of um, things that I grill. So you got to spread this mixture in all over the fish evenly but you don't want to taper on the sides i wonder let me see share my screen if you guys are on the live feed you may you may you may be able to see what i'm looking at so let's see here. I don't know if the live feed got you, but let's see here. All right. So you can see here on the live feed, glad you joined, that we did the pinwheels, rolled them, 
and uh, we cut them into three slices. So how we did it is we did the distribution of the, you know, stuffing, I guess you can call it. Spread it evenly across this large fillet. And then we rolled it up tightly. And once we rolled it tightly, we put butcher's twine around it. Once we got the butcher's twine, we started to cut. And we cut it into these pieces. Nice. Beautiful. Actually, I should have showed this picture first. That one, that might have been better in sequence right there. Okay. So this is where you see we put the uh, mixture and the spinach. Rolled it up. <laughs> I was not prepared to share my screen for this part, <laughs> as you can tell. And we got this product. So at the end, we got the nice looking finished product here of the pinwheel. And let me talk you through the rest of how this went. So once we got it rolled up, I had the Weber kettle going and direct cooking as always. And as I mentioned before, with the other cut of salmon that I did last weekend, I had uh, a nice, nice bed of who was a nice bed of what, Charlie? A nice <laughs> it wasn't like a bed. It was a sheet of foil over um, one of those one of those you know accessories you put on the grill for seafood, right? But I didn't want the possibility of any part of this to stick to the grill. So I didn't want to put it in contact to anything directly. So I used it to foil, but I put it on something that had a lot of holes in it. So the, the heat would still, you know, come through as if it was on the grill grates itself, but it has the protection of the foil. So it doesn't stick. Didn't want to stick. Didn't want to stick at all. But there's a portion to where the reverse sear method was brought into play with this. So had it on the grill, right? And then um, placed those, placed like three of them on the grill. No wood, just charcoal. Same setup I had for the steaks, the tuna, and the other salmon. Same thing. No difference. This is easy, guys. Then I had the Inkbird uh, digital Bluetooth thermometer, smart thermometer that I've talked about previously. And I had like three of the probes that I used because I had three stakes. And I wanted, to, I wanted to make sure for one thing that these things don't get overcooked. You got to cook them to temperature. But also didn't want these things to really cook at different speeds, right? So I could have assumed, could have assumed that if one was at a certain temperature, the others would be. But look, I got four temperature probes. Why not use them, right? That's why I got them. So plugged them all in, realized I had one wrong because it was like, maybe maybe like 40 temperatures uh 40 degrees I say temperatures a lot 40 degrees higher than other ones i'm like hey man something's wrong so when i adjusted it everything was fine then so starting temperature i had was like around 60 degrees internal wanted to get it to 120 before 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 yes there's more before there is a oysters Rockefeller type topping that is put on here that you saw in the image I just shared that uh, my sister showed to April and April replicated it. We had oysters Rockefeller last year. Oh man, that was awesome. I think I'm pretty sure I had an episode about that. Pretty sure I had an episode about that. Uh, if I didn't, I probably should talk about that. But man, okay. So this topping was made. Um, how was it? I want to tell you exactly how it's done. It didn't have anchovies. 
Didn't have didn't have that. Definitely didn't have that. It was Parmesan cheese, uh, this uh, garlic butter, garlic herb butter that was used from the previous cooks. You know, that, get the garlic butter and use it in different different capacities. Man, even if you want to use a little bit of it to, I don't know, make some eggs. It's legit, dude. Um, how about if you want to do some mashed cauliflower? Oh, man. So you don't have to put in garlic. You don't have to put in any extra garlic. You don't have to put in any parsley, anything like that. It covers everything. So this will get you to the point. And, you know, there might be salt, pepper here and there that, you know, put in there to tweak to your flavor of your liking, but that was the base of it. And put that on top when it got to 120 degrees Fahrenheit internal for each of these. And man, when you get at that point, you kind of are like, yeah, I don't want to walk away from this too much because certain proteins, when they get to a certain temperature, they start to accelerate to another stage of temperature quickly and you don't want to get caught off guard you don't want to walk away too far so it's always good to have this internal temperature pro to keep you honest right keep you honest got to be honest all right so got there and put that on there dashed it on there so you put the butter on first of course Put the melted butter on first. The garlic herb butter, beautiful. Drenching on there. If you're very delicate with your brush, you can, um, I don't know, baste it on there, like tap it on there. But make sure, and you should be at this point, if you cooked it to the temperature that I said of 120, you should have had a nice crust form at the top to where if you brush it on, it's not going to uh, compromise the integrity of the pinwheel. Because you still have it in butcher's twine. You, you cut it in these, you know, things. And maybe you kept it in the fridge or something long enough to where, you know, it has a um, way to set, right? So when you get to 120, maybe have a crust on, on each of these, brush that butter on, then you take a spoon and you kind of ladle on. Is it ladle? Ladle the right way? Terminology to say for that? I don't know. Sprinkle that on. Better? Sprinkle? I think that's better. Sprinkle that on. And what I did is move it over to the hot side of the grill. And you're like, whoa, what happened? Where did Charlie, wait, what are you talking about? What did you do? You moved to the hot spot of the grill? Aren't you worried about sticking? No, no, no. Because two things happened. We sprayed the aluminum foil first before putting the fish on there, right? The fish was cooking slowly on indirect heat, right? So the foil helped retain the bottom integrity of these pinwheels while it's on the grill cooking in a slow temp and as the fish cooks it fortifies in its shape and it, the strength of it as it gets closer to the internal temp right so as long as you don't take the fish off of this foil and put it directly on the flame you're fine so what I did and, you know, it's always good to have um, accessories that fit your grill so you can maneuver things around. So what happened is I just moved the tray over that had the holes in it and that the had the aluminum foil covering. Moved it over to the hot side of the grill. Closed it down. Listened to it sizzle a little bit. And then it was probably less than a minute. It's nothing serious. But what it does, I think, is it gives that ability to finish and get to the right temperature, that 
130, 145, you know, from that range on. And it helps like fortify that bottom even more to give it a little bit of a crust. So when you start forking into it, forking into it, yeah, you fork into it. I mean, you're not going to spoon into it, are you? Go a knife into it. I mean, I guess you could knife into it, but you should be at the point where this can like be cut it with a fork. Uh, whatever. But it helps it have more of, of that consistent top to bottom texture. Right? Because it's, it's all about texture, right? You ever had a, a piece of uh, any protein that was perfectly done at the top? Like had nice crust at the top. It was beautifully like temperatured inside, but the bottom piece of what you're eating is like all soggy. Ah man, that that's not cool. No, no. It's like that with like, I don't know. If you if you do like slow cooked chicken in the in the slow cooker, yeah. Like it's always soggy at the bottom, right? You you can't you can't escape it unless I don't know whatever. I mean that's how it is. But this helps you fortify that texture profile consistently from top to bottom. It's not complicated. This is easy stuff. So all you got to do at this point is once you hear it sizzle, don't don't just stand around do nothing. Open it up. Keep an eye on it and see if you see like the little, you know, oil, oil bubbles around it. Once the oil bubbles are forming around it, don't keep it on there too long, but take the internal temperature with an instant read thermometer. And then once it's at that temperature at the most center part of the pinwheel, that 140 temperature. You can take it down to 130. That's fine. Then pull that off to take the whole tray off. And you don't have to worry about transferring the fish multiple times and possibly dropping the thing because, you know, these can get slippery. (laughs) You don't want to move it too much. You don't want to get too, like, yeah, I got this. Whoa. Well, we lost one. That could happen. So just make it easier on yourself. Get a nice tray with holes in it that, you know, it can let heat through and use the foil, heavy duty foil. Um, and you have just this, it's like a baking sheet, a, a, a grilling baking sheet. <laughs> That's basically what you made and put it on there and it, you get the grill flavor. You know, you're not going to go for grill marks with this thing. You're not going to do that. This is not that type of, it's not like steak, steak, you know, beef steak. You're not going to try to get sear marks on this thing. And if you can, if you want, but you may cause yourself to go down a dark path of trying to save your fish from not sticking. Oh, I've warned you. (laughs) So, I mean, it was it was it tasted so good we had two large fillets and we we cut six pinwheels out of both of them grilled three of those yesterday going to grill the next three today probably when it gets dark outside and you know i just want to say before i go wrapping up a little bit cuz you know like hey man I got stuff to do I know I got stuff to do too but you're like man this is a this is a great thing you know the the healthiness of this you know is something too to where you can eat all the time you know Grilling outside when it's spring is fine because it's not cold, but I found that I couldn't do 
this <laughs> outside uh, when the sun's out. And I've had a battle with the bees and their yellow jackets outside trying to kill me when I'm trying to cook this food to where I'm like, I don't know when I'm going to cook this healthy food, you know, because I want to start cooking early and eat throughout the day. And, you know, you start like, uh, man, you know, I could cook this inside, but I already got, I already got the grill going and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get this done, man. Cause this was the whole thing, but these bugs out here, bugs out here. So I was like, okay, it's going to be raining outside, right? That's fine. As long as it's not sunny outside and the bees and wasps or yellow jacks are chasing after me. And then they have to spray them with a water solution to try to wait, make their wings heavier and look like a dumbass out there. You know, my neighbor's looking like, what is this dude doing? Because they don't see the insect that I'm trying to kill. <laughs> they, all they see, what is this dude doing? Is he sp- Why is he spraying air? What? I don't know if you people know me, but I don't like flying insects. Crawling ones, I mean, no, I don't like those either. But at least I don't have to worry about them, like, stinging me and stuff. Like airborne attacks. The grill my stuff last week. And these bees, I think this bee was like out to get me. Yo, I'm out there and these people are like, they gotta be watching me, right? They gotta be watching me because it's nice weather. And I'm like, why is this bee not letting me grill? Like it was protecting the grill. Like the, the family lived in there. And I know that wasn't possible. Why would you do that, stupid bee? Like but it was like hovering, just like, hey, man, how you doing? You want to party? I'm like, no, I don't want to party. So I run inside. <clears throat> I'm not ashamed to say that. I don't want to be stung. I ran inside. I was like, hey, this bee's trying to get me. And then I had to man up. <laughs> and I uh, got some spray. So I got some bug spray. And then I got this um, solution of water and soap that was out there like, like two gun in it, you know what I'm mean? like? Like two pistols, pow, 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 pew, pew, pew. And yo, this bee was apparently like a warrior bee because this fool was like dodging everything. I'm like, whoa, this is kind of like the Matrix. So I'm looking even more weird <laughs> because I'm trying, I'm seeing this. Oh man, don't judge me. Don't judge me. <clears throat> But, yeah, I'm grilling at night. I'm going to grill at night. Said it all because, you know, grilling at night, you, there's, there's two things that happen. It's cooler outside, and at least you just have mosquitoes. For whatever reason, bees and wasps, unless you step on a ground nest that they have, they don't bother you for whatever reason. They just go to sleep, I guess, at night. I know they had a clock like that. But, yeah. So I'm going to grill these the rest of these things when it gets dark i'm not ashamed of that. look bees bees are terrible bees are evil i like the bee movie i like my to be the cartoon but i don't like real bees i know they gotta pollinate stuff and keep like life of greenery going so the carbon dioxide gets taken out of the atmosphere so we can breathe this fresh fresh oxygen oxygen jeez sorry about that Oxygen is hard to say when, you know, it's being compromised on the world level all the time. But, yo, like, seriously, bees, man, why, why, I would be coming up in your hive, be like, hey, what y'all got for dinner? He up in my grill talking about, hey, this is my grill, homie. You ain't Debo? Get out my way, man. I could see if there was like a big flower or something around there and he was trying to guard or if he had a nest somewhere. He didn't have a nest anywhere. What was the nest that I ain't seen any nest? He was just floating around. I spray him away. He comes back. I'm like, this bee is trying to get me. Don't judge me. Do not judge me. You ever got stung by a bee? Don't judge me. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, 
get out there and and try the pinwheel though i mean it it seems intimidating but it's not it's actually really easy it's not time consuming for the prep either as long as you got like a clear system go ahead and do that if you put the spinach on which i really encourage doing uh the, april had a great idea putting that on um because i, I didn't think about it based on how Publix had theirs because they didn't have spinach on the salmon pinwheel, but they had it on the flank steak pinwheel. And we liked it on the on the flank steak pinwheel because it added, added another layer of texture and I you know, I think it just made everything taste better. Yeah. And it made it more healthy, right? It got your veggies. So put it on there. And I would chop up the baby spinach, like not finely chop it up but just chop it up roughly so you can spread it more evenly on top of the mixture so it's not like the leaves aren't poking out of these things you know you want to have it uniform nicely you want to look good you want to cut it evenly if you don't know how to use butcher's twine uh I would I would suggest two people do this. <laughs> one person holds the pinwheel while after rolling. One person rolls the pinwheel. One person rolls one pinwheel. Another person helps putting the twine on because you're going to want to roll these as tight as possible. If you look on YouTube, a lot of the people are doing like one person doing everything and the rolls aren't really that tight. And you're like, ah. That looks like the the filling is going to fall out. Yeah, they get lucky and it doesn't. You might not fare as well, especially if this is your first time. So do yourself a favor. Um, call your family member, loved one, roommate. I don't know, whoever's in the house. Cable guy, tell them to wear some gloves, though. Um <laughs> Not the kale guy. I'm just kidding. Yeah, just have them do the opposite of what you're doing. Like, you hold it, they tie it. And make sure that you tie it well, tight, um, proportionately to where you can cut it in even slices. And then everything else after that is easy. Just cut it nice and slow with a sharp knife. Don't use a serrated knife. Use one knife that, you know, like a butcher's knife, really sharp, but do not use a serrated knife. You don't want to saw this bad boy. You want it to look good. You don't want there to be teeth on this knife to to kind of tear the fish because fish is delicate. You want to cut it slow, take your time, and make it look good. Because, hey, if it's not pleasing to look at it's not going to taste that well to you but we're wrapping up and before i go i want to let you guys know that there's going to be more content coming to you with the other podcast uh have the cooking grits podcast with my mom more content coming to you soon with that the flagship podcast the mav cast podcast We'll come to you with more content. Please listen to the last episode I had with Terrence P. Elmore as we talked about. Well, go listen to it. I'll tell you. It's about the show, Your Honor. And we actually talked about a lot of religious things. You know, listen to those most recent episodes of the MavCast podcast. The other one is the MavTech podcast podcast where i talk all things tech i have a review up for the wise noise canceling headphones awesome product encourage you to listen to that if you're looking for inexpensive noise canceling headphones to get back on flights as the world is opening back up or to have a closed environment from the noisiness of your home (laughs) Either way, it's a great product. So please like, subscribe, share, tell your friends, family, tell your pastor, tell your virtual schoolmates, 
that the podcast channel is always here to give you content that you're looking for. We have four unique podcasts to cover a wide range of topics that I love to speak about. Food, funny stories with Cook and Grits, Tech with the Math Tech Podcast, Grilling with the Backyard Pitmaster Podcast, which this is, and the flagship of more, you know, editorial type coverage. Randomness, you know, of the Mapcast podcast. You can be a producer of the show if you like. Send messages with voice message on anchor.fm or you can shoot a voice message to charliemaverick at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at the Mavcast. What is that, Charlie Maverick? It's ma- yeah. I don't know my handle. Charlie Maverick. Find me there. Yes. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> if you listen to the show, you know how to find me. So just pass on the word and be blessed. Be safe. Mask up. You know, try not to get run over by the crazy people that are back out on the road again. God bless you and be safe out there, people. Hey guys, how you liking the show? How you liking the podcast? How you liking the content in general I'm sending you away? I hope you do. And if you do, and you want to keep making the show better and better and better, which I'm really trying to do, and get it out to more people with the best sound quality possible, and get some possibly celebrities on here, and people from the tech industry on here as interviews and panel guests. Oh, that'd be great. Please support the show via the cash app link I'm going to put on the description show notes yeah so you can also get producer credits by doing so I'm not asking for a specific amount anything that you can give to say thanks and I thank you for being loyal and listening to every everything you can on the podcast channel I hope you come back and share with your friends more be blessed and have a great day